Hello folks, Professor Fiore here. Time for another video. What we're going to do is take a look at a prior video on the op-amp gyrator. And you can think of this as sort of an add-on or an addendum. We're going to prove that that simulated inductor that we created has the proper units. This is the circuit that we're talking about. So in the simple uh, op-amp gyrator video, we had gotten to this point and I had said, all right, this circuit right here simulates an inductor with an internal coil resistance. This Rx value is the value of our coil, right? And we see over here. And the inductance value is the product of three things, that coil resistance, Rx, the gyrator's capacitance, and the gyrator's resistance. So we have a formula over here, LG, the gyrator inductance, is equal to CG times RG times RX. And at the time, oh, I think it was somewhere around 15 minutes into that video, I had said, hey, don't worry about the units on this. You know, you look at this and you go, wait, farads times ohms times ohms? How do I get Henry's out of that, right? Well, it turns out you do although it's not certainly immediately apparent. So I didn't want to get bogged down into that at the time, you know, go off on some little side venture that was going to take too long. Because I know most of you are interested in just getting circuits like this to work. You want to understand the circuit itself, maybe not go through all of the minutia. But I also know that some of you, myself included, kind of like that minutia. You like to have the T's crossed and the I's dotted. So I figured yeah, it's probably worth an extra video to explain exactly how this works. I've never been a fan of just sort of accepting things like that. You know, this is the answer and, and that's the end of it, right? Um, you know, we want a little bit of uh, verification, okay? So in the video, I just state, ignore the farads, the ohms, and the ohms and you're going to get Henry's, right? So here we had 10 nanofarads times 1K. So you think 10 nano times 1K, that's going to get you, uh, you know, a micro, and then times another 100 ohms, that's going to get you a 1,000 um, micro or a milli. And sure enough, you know, LG over here works out to 1 millihenry, right? All right, so how do, in fact, we prove that farads times ohms times ohms gives us Henry's? Now, there's multiple ways of doing this. You could go all the way back to MKS, in other words, meter, kilogram, second. You can get a, uh, an equivalent using just meters, kilograms, and seconds for capacitance, for resistance, for voltage, for all of the electrical um, uh, quantities that we talk about, there is an MKS equivalent. But we don't really need to go back that far. We can go back sort of part way. This is a technique that I like to use to sort of verify certain equations that we have. So our goal ultimately is, all right, does this equation work out as far as the units? In other words, farads times ohms times ohms, does that really give us Henry's? So what we're going to use is instead of going all the way back to MKS, we're going to go back to what I call basic units for electrical. So voltage and volts, current and amps, resistance and ohms, and then charge Q in coulombs, the energy or work, W in joules, and of course time T in seconds. So a real quick example of the approach we are going to take. Take a look at P is equal to IV, in other words our basic power equation. A lot of times this is just presented as, hey this is the way it is, memorize this. Right? Not a fan of that. So you know if you've seen my earlier videos you know what I've done, I've broken this apart. Current is defined as the rate of uh, charge transfer per unit time, so one coulomb per second is an amp. And similarly, voltage is energy per unit charge, so one joule per coulomb is one volt. So you substitute these in, right? Substitute Q over T for I and W over Q for V, and this is the equation you wind up with. P is equal to Q over T times W over Q. Well, obviously the Qs cancel. And what you're left with is W, the energy, over T, time. Well, the definition for power, one watt, is one joule per second. There you go. It's a really quick, compact sort of proof. 
this is the approach that we're going to take. It's going to take a little bit more work than this, but we're going to do the same sort of thing. So let's look at sort of our, our level one, let's call it, all right? Capacitance, resistance, voltage, current. So capacitance, that is defined as the uh, charge per uh, unit voltage. So we've got, um, you know, a coulomb per volt would give us a farad. Resistance, there are multiple ways of defining resistance, but in our case, we're going to use a modification of Ohm's law, which would be volts over current, right? So one volt per amp is one ohm. Um, and then we're going to divide, dive down a little bit deeper for this voltage and current and say voltage is, as I said in the, in the uh, just a moment ago, um, the energy over the charge, okay, the work divided by the charge. So one volt would be one joule per coulomb, and then current, as previously noted, would be the charge transfer over time. So a coulomb per second is an amp. Now we're going to take these things, and we're going to take that approach of substituting. We're going to have to do multiple substitutions, but just watch what happens. So resistance, voltage over current, we substitute the voltage, W over Q. We substitute the, the current, Q over T. But, you know, now I've got like a doubly built up fraction, which looks kind of ugly. So instead of dividing by Q over T, it's easier to multiply by its reciprocal. So we multiply W over Q by the reciprocal T over Q. And what we wind up for resistance is WT over Q squared. In other words, you could think of a unit, right, base units, that would be a joule second per coulomb squared would be equivalent to an ohm. All right, I know that sounds a little weird, but trust me, it's a little less weird than if we went all the way back to meter kilogram second. In any case, that's one way of describing ohms, resistance. All right, now for capacitance, we start with our basic equation, Q over V, right, the charge over the voltage. Expand out the voltage, so we replace that with W over Q. And we're going to do the same thing. Instead of dividing by this, we're going to multiply by the reciprocal, so that's going to be Q over W times Q, or in other words, Q squared over W. All right, so charge squared over the energy, that gives us capacitance. Again, I know it sounds a little weird. You've got squared coulombs over joules, and that's what a farad would be, okay? Trust me, it's all going to work. Next step, get that equation, right? This is the equation we were trying to prove. L is equal to C times R times R. And again, we're only interested in the units here. So substitute in the value that we just came up with, the expression we just came up with for C for R and R. So if you got a short memory here, right? Here's the C, Q squared over the work, right? And then WT over Q squared, right? Energy time over charge squared, for the resistance. So just substitute it in, multiply it all out, all right, and what do you get? Well, it's pretty obvious, a Q squared, Q squared, those are going to cancel, a work square, you know, a work divided by work, that's going to cancel, and we're going to be left with work times squared, okay, divided by Q squared. So you could say that a Henry would be a joule second squared per coulomb squared. And you're thinking, wait a minute, I thought you said this was going to get easier. Well, it will. Just hold on to this. Now the question is, because this is, after all, this is the result of this equation. Now the question is, do I have some other way of describing an, an inductance using these sorts of um, quantities? And it turns out an easy way to do this is an operational description, right? So what do I mean by an operational description? Well, you can have a physical description of an inductor, right? And normally, when we introduce inductors, you know, if you go back to the AC circuits uh, videos, you know, we would talk about things like, well, how many loops of coil do you have? How long is it? How large are those loops? What's the core material? And you can come up with a, uh, an expression, an equation to tell you what the inductance will be, right? The same kind of thing we did with resistance. You know, when you go all the way back, we say, okay, what's the resistivity of the material? What's the surface area of the piece you're interested in? What's the length of it? And we come up with an equation that gives us the ohms, all right? 
So that's sort of the physical layout of it. By operational, what I mean is what is the current voltage characteristic? So we just did this a moment ago with the resistance, right? We say resistance is voltage divided by current operationally. Well, what is the operational current voltage expression for an inductor, right? V is equal to LDI dt. That's your basic equation, right? V is equal, the voltage across the inductor is equal to the inductance times the rate of change of current through it, right? DI dt. So what we do is we just solve for the inductance L. Now, all we have to do is substitute the appropriate simplifications that we looked at a moment ago for these and see if we come up with the same result. So V we already know, right? That's the work per unit charge, right? W over Q. The only question that might be floating around your brain right now is DI dt. What is the rate of change of current versus time um, in terms of units? Well, current itself right, is charge per unit time, Q over T. The rate of change of that with respect to time would be coulombs per second per second, right? It's how much that current is changing per unit time, dt, the rate of change with respect to time. If you find that a little off-putting, if you find that a little confusing, think of it in terms of something like voltage and acceleration, right? So, excuse me, uh, velocity and acceleration. So velocity you might have in meters per second, for example, right? That's basically, you know, how the distance is changing over time. Acceleration is how quickly the velocity is changing. So the acceleration is the derivative of velocity. So you would have a velocity that's measured in meters per second, and then the derivative of that with respect to time would be meters per second per second, in other words, meters per second squared. All right, so it's the same sort of thing here. So the current itself is charge, coulombs per second, and the rate of charge change with respect to times is coulombs per second per second or coulombs per second squared, right? So Q over T squared. So V, right, V, there's the work over charge, and then DI DT is Q over T squared. So again, just do a little manipulation on this. Instead of dividing by this, multiply by the reciprocal, and we get WT squared over Q squared. In other words, energy times time squared divided by charge squared. If you're short on memory, that's the same exact equation we got from the gyrator equation, right? So we work this thing down, we get this, WT squared over Q squared. We work this down, we get WT squared over Q squared. They equate. They're the same. We just take this operational uh, formula, right, expression, description, and we run through the equation we had for the gyrator, we get the same result. Consequently, we know the units work, right? We go all the way back, and we can say, yes, this equation, if you're putting farads here and ohms here and ohms here, that will in fact work out to Henry's. All right. All right. So, you know, that took a couple of minutes and you can maybe appreciate now why I skimmed over that pretty quick in the original video. All right. But again, it's always good to make sure that those little pieces are all connected, that we're not just taking something on faith, right? We have good reasons for doing what we do. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed this, and I'll see you next time. Have a good one.